quick fun facts about Tim, and then I'll turn it over to Tim. I have four brothers, and Tim is my favorite. <laughs> now, as a lad growing up on the farm in Hamburg, New York, I was, the, I was a sheepman, as were some of my other brothers. I still am a sheepman. And Tim was a farmer raising swine, ducks, and yes, chickens. So you'll have to ask him about how he got the name for the pup. And the other little known fact about Tim is that Tim has always been uh, a presenter. He's always been popular. He wins the award at the Kellogg School for being the most popular professor. And he is the only one of, of, my, uh, br of me and my brothers, uh, five of us, who was the king of the prom. So this is a great accomplishment. <laughs> And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim, and hopefully Tim will tell us why he named the book How to Wash a Chicken. Okay, Tim. Well, uh, well, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for hosting this. Uh, Thank you, to, uh, thank you to everyone for coming out today. It is great to see so many Northwestern people and so many Harvard people and HBS friends and, uh, and everyone. So, so thank you for being here today. Uh, and today, we're going to talk today about uh, a topic that is near and dear to my heart, uh, which, is, uh, which is presenting. And I'm going to talk a little bit about doing a good business presentation, especially in the crazy world we live in, uh, the world of big data, and how do we do great presentations in that world. So that's sort of the goal for the, that's the goal for the day. What we're going to do today uh, we'll talk about how do, we, how do we do this. And really what I hope you get today is just a couple ideas you can take with you and apply in your life. Maybe a couple things we can do uh, as we do better, better presentations. I think presenting, by the way, is so fun because, you know, we never quite get it perfect every time. And we keep working on it, and it's always something you can do better. And I think it's a fun topic to sort of think about it and make sense of. So what we're going to do is I'm going to dive in, and I only, have, uh, I only have two hours to get through all this, so I've got to move. <laughs> No, we've got to be done by nine, I think, if, if that's true. I believe that is true. So we're going to talk about why presenting is so important, uh, why, people have, uh, why people struggle, and I think a lot of people do struggle when it comes to doing presenting. And then, uh, then I've got five recommendations for you. We'll talk a little bit about the book. Uh, if you've got questions along the way, though, jump in. If we've got time at the end, we'll do some questions as well and, uh, and all of that. If we don't get through all of this, don't, uh, don't worry. You can just go read the book. It's all in there. So anyway. Makes sense. Got it? Okay, let's get to it then. Why is presenting so important? Well, the reality is most people don't like presenting. Who loves, who loves presenting? Like writing a business presentation and doing a business presentation. This is just big fun, right? Yeah, see, that's it. There's some people love this stuff. There is that group of people, and they love it. And they love writing presentations, and they love doing presentations. It is, though, I will note, a fairly small group of people, I think. Uh, and my students at Kellogg, by the way, uh, are, really no, are really no exception to this. So I do research with my students uh, on occasion. Maybe some of you took some of these surveys. I don't know, but I ask people, you know, do you enjoy presenting? How good are you at it? How good are your colleagues, your classmates? And uh, this is from one of the surveys I did. Do you enjoy presenting one to 10 scale, a 6.51, uh, sort of mediocre? How good are you? 6.82 on a one to 10 scale. How good are your colleagues? 6.84, yeah. So there we are, right? We don't, we, don't, uh, we don't like it very much. We don't think we're very good at it, and we don't think our colleagues are very good at it either. Uh, which is sort of where, by the way, this is all the more amazing, I think, because we have as people an incredible ability to overestimate our skills, right? I mean, if you ask people, are you above average in intelligence, right? What is it? Two thirds of people will say they're above average in intelligence. Uh, getting along with others, right? What is it? 83% of people are better than average at getting along with others. Better than average driving, right? 92% of people. Better than average, right? But, but, but when it comes to presenting, uh, we don't see that. It's very different. Uh, uh, but whether we like it or not, it's a really important thing. Because people present a lot, it is really important to sell your ideas and have an impact in the world. And I think that is true. Even in the world today, we, you know, we communicate with texting, and we communicate on Skype and in all these different ways. But when it comes to make a big decision, people still sit down, and they go through a recommendation, and they look at it, and they walk through it. And, and it's still how we make decisions. It also is really important to think about how you shape your brand. Personal branding is a really important topic. I teach a lot about branding. But personal branding. Is, uh, is I think so important to build a good personal brand. 
And the, pre the presentations you deliver, more than anything, shape your brand. That's, that, I think, is the most powerful thing in terms of how you shape a brand within a company. If you get up there and if you do a great presentation, people are going to look at you and they're going to say, oh, you're smart and talented and a great leader. And if you do a terrible presentation, they're going to say, right, well, none of those, none of those, none of those things. Uh, it also, by the way, is, is what is hard to find in the world today. Right, uh, this whole set of skills. So this, I think, was, this was interesting. This was from the Financial Times. So every year the Financial Times does a survey and they, uh, and they talk to recruiters and they ask them, what are you recruiting for, right? And then what's hard to find? And, and this was from 2018. Uh, what's hard to find? Most difficult skills to recruit, uh, ability to influence others, strategic thinking, drive and resilience, big data analysis, ability to solve complex problems. What's interesting to me is I think four of those are totally about the presentations we develop and, and do, right? Ability to influence others, that's all about how do you put forward a recommendation. Strategic thinking, right? What is that? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But what I think that is, is the ability to take something really complicated and turn it into a logical recommendation. Uh, big data analysis, you know, the problem with big data is not the data. That's not the problem. The problem is making sense of the data and turning it into a recommendation that people can understand and, and follow. And then ability to solve complex problems, it's, it's the same thing, right? And, and so our ability to do this is a really important, a really important skill. Now, a lot of people struggle when it comes to presenting. And I see this a lot with my students. And as you go through the world, you see people who have trouble with this. And there's a lot of terrible presentations in the world. You've probably been to some of them. Uh, why is that? Well, partly that is because uh, I think we don't teach people well how to do this stuff, number one. But number two, very often we use the wrong models, I think. So I, I ask my students, I'm like, well, how do you learn how to present? You know, how do you do this? And one thing I get a lot is people say, you know what I do? I, uh, I watch uh, TED Talks. TED Talks, yeah. Because TED Talks are fabulous. We really like TED Talks, and I try to model myself on that. All right. And I'm like, well, that's, that's good, yeah, that's good. But there's a problem with that, right? Uh, uh, every TED Talk has basically the same format, right? Every, what are TED Talks like? Every TED Talk is, every TED Talk is, they're really short. Yeah, they're like 10 minutes long, 10, 12 minutes, they're short. TED Talks are, what's that? They're memorized, yes, they're all memorized, and they go through it, they memorized all the way through, every one of the TED Talks, right? And, right, any questions? No, no question. No, no, there's no Q&A. Anyone challenge the data? Anyone challenge the, no. Uh, everybody in the audience, by the way, is happy to be there. You know, they've paid money to be there, right? That is true. And at the end of it, what happens? Right? Everybody cheers, you walk off, and that's a TED Talk. And that's all great. You love that. The only problem is that is not like any business meeting I've ever been to. I mean, the average business meeting is very different. The average business meeting, people are sitting around, they're grumpy, they're there for two hours, everyone's challenging the data, there's all this. I mean, it's just a totally different thing. So what works in a TED Talk is not necessarily going to work when it comes to doing actually a good business presentation. Or people tell me, oh, what I do is I model myself on Steve Jobs. You know, because he was such a wonderful presenter and a leader, and, you know, I try to present like Steve Jobs. Again, you can learn a lot from Steve Jobs, no doubt. But be careful with this also. Uh, what's the problem with modeling yourself on Steve Jobs? You're not Steve Jobs. Yeah, we're not. None of us. No. And, and, and the reason that, no, but the reason that matters is he could do things that, that we can never do. He had so much charisma, so much personality, so much respect that he, a lot of what he did, if we try to do it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Here's just one example of that. So uh, if, if you ever watch a lot of Steve Jobs videos, right, what you know is at the end of his big presentations, almost always, he finishes and he says, right, he wraps it all up and then he says, oh, but we do have, right, there's just that one more thing, right, and he saves the big news, the biggest news for the very end, right, and then he drops, and he does this sort of all the, all the time, right? This was always just a, a hallmark. Okay, here's one piece of advice. If you don't take anything else from today, right? Next time you're doing a big presentation for a bunch of senior executives, right? You know what you should not do, right? Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. I mean, you get to the end of the presentation and you're like, bud, wait a minute. We do have one more thing that, you know, the new product's been delayed by six months. And you're like, what? <laughs> Killing me. Killing me. 
All right, here's five recommendations. Five, these are just five things you can think about when it comes to doing a presentation. Uh, there's a lot more in the book you can read about. It's five sort of ideas for today. All right, so uh, the first idea for today, uh, how do we do a good presentation? Well, very simple. Uh, the first one is just to be really clear on the purpose. So one, I think the great hallmarks of good presenters is they know when to present and they know when not to present. And picking your moment is a really important thing. Uh, the insight here is very simple. Everybody's busy. Uh, wasting people's time does not enhance your career. And some of the toughest presentations are those presentations where you're presenting to people and they're like, oh, I just don't care. And, they're, and, and they don't. Or, or if you're in a presentation, you sit down and 30 seconds later, you're like, oh, no. I mean, I don't need to be here. This is not going to. And that's just terrible. So uh, the first question uh, I think you always ask yourself is what's the purpose of this presentation? And if the purpose isn't clear, uh, you should just cancel the darn thing. And, and I think knowing when to present is just so important in that, in that, uh, in that front. Uh, and then, by the way, and then you should put it right at the start. So five things I think you'd always have in a presentation, right? Five, always. Right, your title page, the purpose, what are we doing here, right? The executive summary, what are some of the main points that we're covering? And uh, an agenda, and then a conclusion, and, a, and next steps. Okay, so I anyway, have those five things. Uh, and then I would always think about writing a presentation brief. So anytime you're doing a piece of advertising, you develop a, a creative brief for advertising. You know this if you went to business school, took one of those advertising classes. Because you always try to think about what are we trying to communicate before you try to communicate it, you, what are we trying to get across. And I actually think the same thing works really well for presentations. So before you start working on a presentation, you just put together the brief, like what are we trying to do? What goes on there? The purpose, what are we doing? The audience, uh, who am I talking to? The format, what is it? Is it a big meeting like this? Is it going to be a Skype meeting? Is it a Zoom meeting? What is it? And, uh, and then other considerations. For, well, for example, if you're right before a big holiday weekend, well, you probably want to remember that because everybody wants to get out of there really fast, so keep it short. You know, uh, The audience. I think the audience is so important to think about before you do a business presentation, right? Who are we presenting? I like to think about three things, right? What are their, what are their uh, preferences? What are their uh, priorities? And what are their perceptions? What are your three Ps, right? So if I'm going to present to somebody, one of the first things I always think about is like, what are their preferences? Like, what do they like? Well, we know is certain people like certain things, you know? So some people like the color blue and some people like the color red. I don't care. But if I'm presenting to somebody and if I know they like the color blue, well, I'm going to make my presentation well, it's going to be blue. I mean, you know, just because I know they like that, I'm trying to make them happy. So if I know they like something, it's very useful to, to do that. Now, back when I was craft, at Kraft Foods, I saw this. I was presenting to a guy, uh, Hugh Roberts, a uh, really smart guy, really tough to present to. He was sort of a nightmare. But he was the senior guy at, in our division. But any time I presented to Hugh, what I knew is Hugh hated it when uh, slides would build. Right? You don't know, like one thing and then something else comes flying on like that. He hated that. He's like, just show me the slide. Don't like tease me with this. So anytime I presented to Hugh, I was like, okay, we're not going to, we're just going with the slide. I mean, it's it was just very useful. Uh, their, uh, their perceptions also really important. What do they know? Right? How much do they know about this topic? How much do they know about the project I'm talking about? How much do they know about any of this? If I'm presenting to somebody, if they know a lot, well, I'm going to start in a very different place than if I'm talking to somebody and if they don't know anything about it. Right. Just uh, Tuesday, I was in Boston. I was doing a talk for a, for a big pharma company with their, with their payer group. Right. And one of the, this I think is a huge deal in that kind of a world. That's a very complicated world. And, and so the, one of the questions is for that group, if they're going to present to somebody who knows the way payer economics work, it's a totally different presentation than if you're presenting to somebody who doesn't know that world. And you just have to start in a very different place. Right? And then their priorities. What does your audience care about? If you can connect your points to their priorities, I mean, that's great marketing. That's what we do in marketing. And that's always our question. So what do they care about when they're, when they're doing things? All right. So, uh, so, so number one. All right, start number two. So then number two, you uh, start by finding the story. So I think in a presentation, you always go to this. Your first step should be finding the, finding the story. Now, a typical way to write a presentation is sort of like this. All right, you identify your topic, you gather up the information, you put things in sort of a logical order, you create your pages, go present it. That's how you do it. Now, but I would suggest this, this approach really doesn't work very well these days, right? The problem with this approach is, right, the problem with this is uh, step number two, gathering relevant information. And that's a problem because... Right? We just have so much relevant information. I mean, how much relevant information do you now have? Right? You think about Purell. How much relevant information is there in the world of Purell? I mean, 
I mean, there's so much relevant information. If you do this, what happens? You end up with these presentations that are huge and clunky and full of data and full of information. And it's really hard. It's a really tough way to write a presentation. I don't think that, that doesn't work. So instead, what do you want to do? Well, you want to find the story. Instead, you'd always like, what's the story here in my presentation? So Carmine Gallo, he's a big speaker. Creating the story, the plot, is the first step to selling your ideas with power, persuasion, and charisma. Succeeding at this step separates mediocre communicators from extraordinary ones. Or Chris Anderson from uh, TED. You just let the speaker take you on a journey, one step at a time. And thanks to our long history around campfires, our minds are really good at tracking along. And I think there's something, there's something, it's like, what's the story of this presentation anyway? So how do you find your story? Well, there's different ways you can do it. Uh, two ways I like to do it, and you may do it in different ways, I don't know. Storyboards and then, uh, and then speak, then write. So storyboards, if you're doing one of these, all you do, if you've done this, right? You take a piece of paper, three horizontal lines, three vertical lines, you've got nine boxes. Each box then represents a page in your, in your presentation. And all you do is you just sit there and you start jotting down, what am I gonna cover, right? And I say, where do I start? Well, in March, we launched the new product. All right, I guess that goes in the first box. What's the next box? Well, it got off to a great start. What's the next box? Well, it got off to a great start because the sales force executed it so well. Next box, well, but then everything started slowing down. And, uh, and by the end of the summer, we were in a world of hurt, right? And then, and, and then you look at it, as you do it, you're like, wait, does this flowing? And very often you'll be in the middle of it and you're like, oh, it doesn't quite work, right? And then you gotta rework the, you gotta rework the flow. Uh, when you do a storyboard though, one of the really important things is you, is you, like, uh, you, use, a, you uh, use a pencil, you could use an erasable marker, or something like that, but, but you, wanna be, you wanna make it very easy to get rid of what you've written. It's like four words in the box and, and you're just working the story. You just keep working it again. And a lot of people like to use post-it notes to do this. That works too. You, know, you move your post-it notes around and you try, to find the, you try to find the story. Oh, by the way, now everybody these days, you know what people love now? Data visualization. And I have a colleague at Kellogg who teaches all about data visualization. I love data visual. You know, these like, where it's like, you know, and so cool. I love that. This is not the time for data visualization, right? Not the time. The problem with data visualization is you work on one of those really cool visuals, right? And you get it all working out, so things are flying in. The problem is if you do that, you fall in love with the visualization. And you're like, it is so cool, that thing, that is awesome. I am putting that in the presentation. It may not fit in, but I'm putting it in there, because that is so, I spent a whole week doing it, so. No, but you don't, but you never want to do that. You want to say, like, what's the flow of this thing? And, and you keep working at it. Uh, the other way you can do it is you can speak, then write. And this actually works pretty well. The insight here is very simple, is that we all can speak pretty well. So if I ask you, what is it now? It is Friday. So if I say, you know, what, what are you doing this weekend coming up? Well, you'll probably tell me. We're going to go out to dinner tonight and whatever. It's all good. It's going to be a nice weekend, a little chilly, but okay. And, uh, but if I were to say, could you just write me maybe 1,500 words on what you're doing this weekend? Right? Then you're like, oh, 1,500 words. I don't know. I don't have time. That's going to take all morning. I don't have time to do I got a writer's block already. I don't even know where to start. And, and we just don't write naturally. We don't, we speak naturally. We don't, as babies, we start speaking, right? We don't start writing, you know? We, so when we speak the night, all we do is we just say, like, what is the story? What is this? Tell me it. Right? What's the story? What's going on? Well, we started a new product, got off to a great start, you know? And as you do it, all you do, either, you either record it or you have someone jot down your points, but your mind will just find the story on its own. That's the, if you try to write it, you lose it. But if you just say it, and then you try to work the story, right? Uh, uh, by the way, once the story is clear, and only when the story is clear, then you start creating your pages, right? And each page, of course, simple, uh, a headline. Oh my gosh. All right, so here's one thing. This just really annoys me. So just w always, when you're doing your next presentation, if you're writing a presentation, put a headline, for gosh sakes, on the page, right? Like, you know, like put a headline on there, every page. This, like, one thing you can do to make your presentations better, a headline. And the headline isn't a chart title. It's not like sales by region. That's not a headline. No, the headline is the West region is driving the sales growth. Like, what's the point of the page? Just put that on there, right? Uh, three or four bullet points, simple charts, parallel structure, right? Uh, you know, like, you know, on a simple chart like this, this is what we like, right? Headlines, there it is, right? There's your headline, there's your chart, there's the data, the data supports the headline. Right, nice, simple, nice, simple page, right? What we try to avoid is pages like, uh, pages like this, right? This page. Yeah, I love that. I mean, such a beautiful page, right? Uh, so much work went into this page. You look at, you're like, you, what's the problem of this page? It's such an attractive page. U.S. Pharmaceuticals, Industry, Promotions, Overview. Too much information. That, well, why, yeah, why is it too much information? 
It's very dense. Yeah, so it's very, you're like, look, visually, this is really hard. It's, it's a lot, it's dense, it's a lot of information. Also, what else is going wrong here? No headline. No headline. There's no headline. So then you look at this page and you're like, what in the world am I supposed to conclude from this page? I, I like, I don't, are we going, it's going up, it's going down, it's going up, down. I, I mean, I, like, I don't know. Like, what's the point? <laughs> this is just, see, if you do a page like this, it's really hard for your audience. They're like, I don't know what, and then they come to conclusions you don't want them to come to. Right? And you look at this page, I don't know what you're trying to communicate here, but I'm not sure I would get it. I'm not sure it's clear what anyone would get from this from this page. Okay? The goal in all of this is to try to make it easy. So, Daniel Kahneman, you, you know that one, that you've read that book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a great book, by the way. But Kahneman is this great theory. He says, you know, there's two ways of thinking. There's system one, system two. System one thinking, these are all easy things. System one. Two plus two is... For what day is it today? Well, it's Friday. How's the weather? Well, it's cold. So that's all easy stuff, right? Then there's hard stuff. System two, right? What's 27 times 64? And you're like, well, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. What's, what's the name of everybody in, in the room here? Just tell me the name of everyone. You're like, I, 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 don't, I don't know that. It's going to take a lot of, a lot of work, right? Uh, what's going to happen with the impeachment hearings? You're like, I, I don't know that. I mean, that's all hard stuff. That's all hard. It, system two things. In a good presentation, you're trying to make it really easy, system one. So, you know, uh, uh, when you're in a state of cognitive ease, you're probably in a good mood. You like what you see, believe what you hear, trust your intuitions, and feel the current situation is comfortably familiar. And that's the goal of it. And a good presentation, by the way, it's a beautiful thing, I think, right? Because you walk through it, and you just go a little step by step. And each step is really easy. And you walk along, and you walk, and you get to the end of it, and you say, that was easy. Right? And of course, you're like, that wasn't easy at all. I mean, that was really hard, but we just made it easy because each step seemed very logical. Right? Number two. All right, number three, uh, pre-selling. All right, so if there's, uh, again, if there's one thing you can do to make your presentations go well in this world, you just pre-sell them. All right, pre-sell them. It's the key to happiness. Uh, uh, your most important step. Uh, the insight here is very simple. Surprises, right? Surprise can be exciting and fun. Right? Uh, and we do love surprises. We love surprise parties. We love surprise uh, presents, chocolates. These are all wonderful things. Champagne. All good. Uh, in a business setting, though, a surprise usually rarely works out well. Right? When you get into a big meeting and you're like, surprise, <laughs> that's usually not a best practice. No. So before a meeting, you should always go meet with, pe meet with people and you take them through the, the presentation ahead of time. It, it's just a very simple thing. But when you do that, by the way, wonderful things happen. Number one, your presentation gets a lot better. Because you'll meet with somebody and they will say, Jeff will say, well, you know, have you thought about this? And you're like, no, I didn't think about that. And you like make your presentation better and tighter and more logical so it makes the presentation better. Uh, then you get people on board also by meeting with them ahead of time. You're like, are we, are we good, right? And they're like, we're good. And then, and then you get much more confident. So eventually you go walking in the room and you're like, I think this is going to go pretty well because everybody's already seen it. So... This is going to go fine, and it's a very, uh, it's a great way to, it's a great way to do it. Uh, and pre-selling is then a really useful thing to, a really useful thing to do. The thing about pre-selling, though, is, uh, is you've got to think about how you do it, right? You want to meet with people well in advance. That's really important. You don't want to go the morning of a big presentation. You've got to get there three days, four days ahead of time, maybe a week, because you need time to respond to their questions. If I meet with Jeff, he's going to have questions, he's going to have, and I've got to respond to those things. Bring a draft. Oh yeah, this is really important when you're, when you're pre-selling. You always want, it should always say draft in big letters. Rough draft, initial scribbles, first thoughts, uh, you know. Uh, the reason is because when you're pre-selling, you really want to make it clear that you want their input, right? And if you bring what looks like the final document, it doesn't look like you actually, it looks like you're done. You don't want their input. But if it says draft, then you're like, I'm clear, I'm just working on it. I really need your help. I value your opinion. Right? It could be done, by the way. The whole thing could be done, printed, finished, right? And you still want to write on it. Fr draft, rough draft, just first cut, you know. And I'll get their questions and input. Oh, and then you got to be sure to act on the input. This is a big one. When you pre-sell, if you've done this in your life, you know what happens. Sometimes you get really meaty comments, really, you know, substantive. And then sometimes you get really stupid comments where people will be like, wait, the font no, the x-axis, the label on the x-axis is in one font, but that's different than the font of the y-axis. And you're like, what the? Yeah, I mean, that's the dumbest comment. I mean, I mean it's true, but that's a dumb comment. I mean, who has time for that kind of stuff? We're really busy. So, but, but here's the thing. If you fix that, if you fix that, right, when you get in the big meeting, will the person notice it? They will notice it. They will notice it, I promise you. And then they will think, they will think, 
listen to me. You listen to me. You listen to me, and they're going to think, right? Well, you have good follow through, and you have good attention to detail, and you have good judgment. That was a good point of view. That was a good piece. Of and, uh, and you took my advice, and it's now sort of the shared thing, and I had an impact on this presentation. It's all good. You're like, I like this person very much. A, if you don't fix it, right? Because it was a stupid comment. If you don't fix it, will they notice that? Mm -hmm. They will notice that. And then they'll think, they will not say this, but they will think, you did not listen, you do not care, you don't value my judgment. And then they start going, then they're like, oh, this is a stupid presenter, and it's a stupid presentation, I don't like it anyway. And, 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 and just that little thing just sort of sends it, sends it totally off the rails. Setting the room. So setting the room, this is one I find people don't spend enough time on uh, when it comes to doing presentations. The, the basic insight here is that if you set up a room well, you'll naturally be inclined to do a, a nice presentation. And if the room is set up in a tough way, it's really hard to do a good presentation. It's just hard. So what do you do when you set up a room? So, so you always want to think about, uh, you know, first you need space to move around. So when you're doing a presentation, I think you always want to move around. Uh, now you can work with coaches. You know, you get sort of life coaches and things and, 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 and or presentation coaches and they'll give you guidance. You know, you should take three steps this way and pivot and three steps this way and little ball, big ball, bigger ball. And, and it's all good stuff. Uh, I don't worry too much about that because I think if you have space to move around, you will move in a way that is comfortable for you. And I just think that's sort of what happens. But for that, you need space to move around. All right, often you'll get to a presentation, for example, and the room will be set up like this. All right? By the way, who sets up rooms? The staff facilities people. And they do a great job and they set up rooms. Right? They'll set it up in a way that looks sort of obvious, logical. Now, but the thing to remember, the people setting up rooms are not presenting people. They're just not the presenters. They're the, 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 the logistics people. So they set up a room like this, right? right? What's the problem with this, right? Well, this is a terrible setup. This is a nightmare for presenting. Because if you look at this, or the question is, right, here's your tables, by the way. There's your tables, there's your projector, your screen. The problem is, where exactly are you supposed to stand? Right, when you're doing your presentation. Well, I don't know. You can stand over here in the corner, okay? I guess that's where you'll be. You can't, once the presentation starts, though, you won't be able to get through here because there are going to be people sitting at those chairs. You don't want to stand here. I mean, that's sort of weirdly in the round. I mean, you don't want to be there. You can't be here. I mean, you never, by the way, you never, don't ever get in front of that projector, right? If you're ever in front of the projector, I mean, it's just, I mean, you know, you're sitting here, you're squinting. You're like, what? No, if you can see the bright light, you're in the wrong place. Sometimes you'll see that it's really sad. Someone's doing a presentation and you'll see it. It'll be like the projector's like right across the forehead. <laughs> or it's like right down the body, like they're having an x-ray or something. It's like right down the, no, you, no, no. It, it's, that's, a, that's a really hard room. But here's the thing. If you get there ahead of time, you can easily fix this room. You just push those things off to the side. Now, what did you just do? Very simply, you turned it into a really nice room. Now you can be here, right? You can be over here. You can walk up here. You can cut over to this side and move around. Beautiful setup. Right? And, and it is though, but you got to get there early to a presentation and you get there early and everything's fine. I was doing one in Denver recently and I got there and, and this was for was like 120 people or something. Anyway, they had six rows of 20 chairs. It was like set up like that, six rows. And I looked at it, I'm like, wow, this is a really tough room, a tough room because I'm really far in that room from the people at the back and there's like all these bars, it's really, that's a tough room. So I was looking at it, I'm like, what could you do? But then I'm like, wait a second, right? Could we just pull these tables apart? I'm like, hey, you can pull them apart, I'm like, sure. So then I'm like, okay, let's pull them apart. So then what I did is I just opened up a runway right down the middle of the room, and then I go walking right up there, and it was great. So it was changed the room dramatically. I did another talk, I got there, and, and, uh, and I got to the room, and there was this weird, you've seen these, I think, like, there, there, there's this weird little stage at the front of the room, like a little six by six little stage. And I'm looking at the stage, I'm like, wow, that's a, Little stage, that's a real weird little stage there. And then I'm like, this is really a problem because I don't want to stand on the stage. Because if I stand on the stage, I can't really walk around. I like to wander around. Also, I'll probably fall off the stage and that would be awkward. So I don't want to do that. But I also don't want to not be on the stage because if there's a stage and you're not on the stage, then everybody's like, why are you not on the stage? That's, that's weird too. So then I'm like, darn, I don't know. But then I'm like, can you just get rid of the stage? And they're like, well, I suppose. And they're like, yeah, okay. And I tell these people come and they haul out. And then it was perfect. It was great, right? Uh, if you get there early, you can set up the room. You can make it, you can make it work, right? Uh, other things, you want to find a place for your notes, uh, which is important. I love notes when you're presenting, by the way. Having notes, I believe, uh, uh, if you're doing a business presentation especially, I am a big supporter of having notes. 
because business presentations are full of numbers and you want to get the numbers right. And if you try to remember the numbers, you will stress your mind and cause a lot of challenges and you'll be like nervous, you'll forget the numbers. So what you do is you have your, you just write them on the down, you write down your notes, right? It's all good. Now the only problem with notes is you never want to carry your notes when you're presenting. You don't ever want to do that, right? Because you're carrying your notes and what happens? Well, what happens is either I read my notes, right? I'm reading from my notes and that's not good, you know. Or I'm not reading from my notes. And if I'm not reading from my notes, everybody says, why we have all those notes? I never looked at them the whole time. So what you want to do with your notes is what you do is you find it, you just set them down, find a place to put them, right? Like right there, see that would be great. So then what happens, I get some question about sales in 2017 or something. I can walk over, like sales in 20 seconds, I can glance down, I can see that it was 22.1, up 9.4% versus the prior year, and I got my number and I'm all, and I'm all good to go. But you just got to find a place. Where am I going to, where am I going to put them? Uh, be diagonal from the decision maker. You always want to be across the room. Unplug the confidence monitor and put your computer out of the way. Confidence monitors. Oh, I hate, these are terrible things. So you've seen these things, right? Con these are these little screens they put in front of you. Like at a big conference, you'll see a lot of these things. These com Either they're down, down low or they're sort of up there. But they're so, the theory is so you don't have to look back at your slides, right? You can just look ahead and... But they're, and, and people love them because they make you feel so important and excited, you know, and, but they're terrible. They're terrible. Yeah, you don't ever use these things. Unplug them, cover them up. The problem is when you're doing a presentation, ideally you like to connect with your audience, right? And, and what you like to do if it's really going well, you like to just guide them right through it, right? So you're like, okay, all right, now look at me, look at me. Okay, great. Now let's all look up here. Great. Okay, now let's look back at me. And let's look back up here again. Right? And, and, and when it's working, you, you're just like, as soon as I start looking at this confidence monitor down on the floor, I lose it, right? Because now I'm looking at this, I'm not looking at you, I'm looking at this, you know. Also the computer, right? Oh yeah, the, the, the uh, you know, the, I find people love to present looking at their computer. You yeah, know, don't do that either, that's terrible. Oh, it's uh, not like the worst, I saw this the other day, the worst thing, you know what people now do? Right, they present with their phone, right? Yeah, they have their, f have you seen this? Let me kind of borrow your phone. They, they sit there looking at their phone, and you're like, oh, you are killing me. No, don't ever, don't ever do that. I mean, you're just checking your emails up here. I, you don't, don't ever do that. Okay, finally, number five, uh, you want to be nervous and you want to project confidence, which seems like an oxymoron there, right? But, but, but it's true, I think, right? You do go, when you get to do the actual presentation, I think you really want to cultivate this feeling of being nervous and confident all at the same time, which is this like weird mix of emotions before a big presentation. Uh, it, it's a little bit like, I think before a big race. I don't know, anyone do triathlons, marathons, things like that, right? Do these things, right? Yeah, it's, it's like, I think at the starting line before that. So I sort of stumble through the Chicago triathlon every year. And, and every year it's sort of the same thing. I get to the, the start of it and I'm always sitting there, you know, and you're in your bathing suit or something, and I'm like, oh, this was just a really bad idea. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, mean I, haven't I haven't trained enough. I'm not ready for this. I, I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm probably gonna drown this year. I mean, this is terrible, I mean. But then I'm like, you know, I've done this, I can do this. I know I, I've done it like 10 times, I can do this. But then I'm like, ah, oh, but this year I haven't trained, I mean, uh, and, and, it, and it's that weird, but I think that's the feeling, feeling you want. Now, the first thing to remember though, is that you should be nervous. A lot of people, they tell me, they're like, Tim, I'm just a terrible presenter. I get so nervous, you know? And I'm like, wow, that is so wrong. That's so wrong because you should, you should be nervous. That's absolutely how you should be feeling. As Scott Birkin, he's a big speaker, uh, we are programmed to fear being alone in open territory without a weapon and in front of a crowd. And it is true, deep in our soul is like this very risky thing. Lucy Calloway from the Financial Times, uh, she writes, she says, you know, unlike most phobias, being frightened of speaking in, uh, speaking in public is entirely rational. And it is, right? When you're going to do a big presentation, you should be nervous, right? Well, because what's gonna happen? If the presentation goes well, what happens? Right, well, you're elated. you're elated, right? And your brand is better and the recommendation moves forward and people think you're charming and smart and brilliant, that's gonna be great. And if it goes poorly, what happens? Right, what happens is you're fired. Right, you're fired. And, I don't, and that, by the way, that does happen. Right? I, don't you, I don't know if you've seen it happen, but it's really when somebody gets fired in like one presentation. And, and it's spectacular when it happens, but it does happen. I mean, you go up there and it goes terrible. That's the end of, that's the end of it. You're out of a job. And so if that all doesn't make you nervous, I don't know what's going on in your head. I mean, that should make you nervous. It really should. But the thing to remember is that being nervous is really good, right? I mean, when we're nervous, what happens when you're nervous? If you're nervous about a presentation, what do you do? What do you do, Tristan? You... If you're nervous about it, you practice. 
practice. You practice it, right? Yeah, you do. You practice it and you? What do you do? You right? You focus, you take it seriously. Uh, you go through it, you look for typos, you check your numbers, you pre sell it, you do all the things you should be doing. Where you get really nervous is when you're not nervous. Because then you're going to go walking in there and you're not ready and, and it's going to be a terrible thing. And it's all good when you're, when you're presenting. The challenge though is how do you feel confident when you're feeling nervous? And I think that's this weird combination. So how do you do this? So the first thing you can do is just remind yourself that you're the expert. And usually that's true. Whenever you're doing a presentation, you almost always know more about the topic than your audience, or you've thought more about it, the topic, than your audience, and you just remind yourself of that. You're like, on this topic this day, I have thought about this probably more than people who have been in the room today. And, and it's very useful to remind yourself of that. Back when I was at Kraft, at one point I was the, uh, I was the product manager on Parquet, but I was responsible for the sticks, just the sticks of parquet. That's it, that was my little business, the sticks of parquet margarine, that was it. And I spent all my time working on sticks of parquet. But whenever I went to do a presentation about my business, you know, I was always fine because I was, at the time, at the time I would just remind myself that I was in the world, the world's expert on sticks of parquet margarine. And there was nobody in the world who knew more about that business than I did. And I think that was true, actually, because I was the only person in the world who spent all day, every day, working on that business. So I did know a lot about the business. I'm happy to talk. If you want to talk about sticks of parquet, I'm happy to. You know, I know about it. And that's a useful frame of mind. The second thing is just to use your slides. So your slides are there for two reasons. They're there for your audience, but they're also there for you. So if you're worried about forgetting a number, uh, forgetting a point, you just put it on your slides. You look back. You're like, oh, yeah. I was supposed to make that point now, and it just reminds you of it. Also, if you use your slides well, it'll, it'll help you avoid awkward moments. Okay, so the third thing you got to do is to, is to know your figures. So in a business presentation, the way you get in trouble more than anything else are the numbers, the figures. So anytime you do a presentation, what you always want to do is just go in there and know every number. And you like know everything about the number. Right, because that's the way, if you see in a presentation go wrong, it's almost always the numbers. So if you put a number in your presentation, just know, and, and you think that's easy, but that's not easy. So you're like 35% market share. You know, it's begotten water filtration or something. You're like, okay, that's easy. But no, like what is that number? Is that a share of dollars? Is that share of units? Is that year to date? Is that through the end of the third quarter? How does that compare to a year ago? Is that trending up? Is that trending? Now, if you know all that stuff, you get a question about it. And you're like, oh yeah, that's a dollar share figure. It's through the end of the third quarter. It's up 0.2 points versus last year. And, uh, and it's up uh, 0.4 points versus the first half. Anything else? And you're like, okay, right, I guess you know the number. And, and, and it's just a beautiful thing. Be very careful on your numbers because when you get tripped up on your numbers, that's when things really go, really go terribly awry. It's like this. Okay, so this is, a, uh, this is a radio interview from the UK. And a politician had called in to a radio show host. And she had just explained their plan. And their plan was they were going to hire uh, 10,000 new police officers. And they had set aside a budget of 80 million pounds to pay for this initiative. So she just had taken them through it. And that's our plan. And anyway, here's how that all, here's how that all goes the 80 then. Million is the 80 million, right? Yeah. But if you, if you, I don't understand. If you divide 80 million by 10,000, you get 8,000. Is that what you're going to pay these policemen? No, we're talking about um, uh, an, a, a process over four years. I don't understand. What, what, what is he or she get? 80 million uh, divided by 10,000. It was 8,000. So I, what are these police officers going to be paid? We will be paying them the average... Has this been thought through? Of course it's been thought through. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is um, that the, the additional cost in year one, when we anticipate recruiting 200, so about 250,000 policemen, will be 64.3 million. 250,000 policemen? And women. So you're getting more than 10,000? You're recruiting 250,000? No, we're, we are recruiting 2,000 and perhaps 250. And the cost... So where, where did 250,000 come from? <laughs> And it just goes, and it just goes on, and it just goes on, and, and she's lost track of everything, she's flailing, and this is just disastrous. I mean, it's, 
Uh, just know your know your numbers, and then you got to practice it. The more you practice it, the better it'll go. Uh, you lots of ways. You can film yourself. Uh, I find that painful. You, I don't like to do that. But you can also you just take just go through it. You can present your coffee cup. You can present your dog or your cat or your collie. It doesn't matter. But every time you go through it, it gets better. It gets smoother. You figure out your transitions. All of those things. All right. Uh, all those. Things. Okay. So uh, five things, be clear on the purpose, find the story, pre-sell it, set the room, be nervous and project confidence. Very quickly about the book, about the book. So I have this new book, uh, How to Wash a Chicken. It's got a very strange title to it, but it's all about how to do a good presentation. And it's just got practical tips in it. A lot of the presenting stuff I find is so interesting because it's not hard stuff, it's so simple. And yet we don't do it. And, and if we do it though, it makes our presentations much better and much more and much more effective. So, so, uh, so you should grab a copy of it. We have a bunch of them there. They're all signed. They make wonderful holiday gifts, by the way. I had the holiday <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, but go post a review, spread the word, all of those things. Oh, I have a website too, howtowashachicken.com, which amazingly, you'll be surprised to hear this, that website was available. That domain was unclaimed. <laughs> unclaimed, unclaimed. Uh, oh yeah, and reviews are really important. I'm trying to get to like 100 reviews. So if you all go post a review, that'll be awesome. By the way, a lot of people tell me, you know, I'll, I'll post a review, but before I can post a review, I've got to finish the book, right? Uh, let me fill, I'll fill you in on a secret though. You know what, uh, to post a review, you actually don't have to, to finish the book. You don't even have to read the book. You can just go on there and say, you know what, that's just a nice looking chicken on the front. And that would be a sufficient five stars, good looking chicken on that front. Anyway, uh, uh, if you've got questions, you can get in touch with any, any questions. We've got, like we got like two minutes for questions, right? Yeah, yeah, real quick. got to ask, well, why the title? Oh, the title, sure, yeah. So the title, uh, okay, so, so, so uh, writing a book, it takes forever. So I started the book, and the uh, initial title of the book was Breakthrough Business, uh, Breakthrough Business Presenting. It was like my other book, Breakthrough Marketing Plans. I thought I'd have a whole franchise going. Anyway, then a year went by, and I got sick of that title. So I changed it to The Art of Business Presenting, and I thought that was nice. And then I said it to my friend Jonathan Kapolsky, who's CMO at Deloitte. And I'm like, Jonathan, would you read the book? Tell me what you think. He's like, Tim, I love the book. But your title is like deathly dull. That is terrible. You got to take that chicken story, pull it up to the front of the book, and call the book How to Wash Your Chicken. And I'm like, Jonathan, you have lost your mind. And, but, but then I thought about it, and I'm like, darn, maybe I should. So it relates to two things. One, that's the first presentation that I actually ever did as a kid. As a seven-year-old, I did a presentation on the topic of how to wash your chicken. If you are curious about that, by the way, you can read the book or just come see me after. I'll tell you. Uh, but, also, but also, it's a metaphor, right? So if you're going to take a chicken to a chicken show, you've got to clean it up so it looks its very best. Same thing, though, with a recommendation at a company. If you're taking forward a recommendation, an update, you want to clean that up, too. So if you're going to go to a, a presentation, you've got to go, you've got to clean up, you've got to wash your chicken. Wash your chicken, you gotta wash your chicken. Okay. right? Yeah? Um, what do you do when you do a presentation and you have like, these takeover people who like, they say they're going to ask a question, but then they get to start talking about their business in like two, three minutes. How do you be like nice to them but okay. not rude? Yeah, so if someone takes over the business, uh, takes over the, the conversation, the, the big thing when you're presenting is you, I think, you always want to stand up. And if you stand up, it gives you enormous power. A lot of people say, at my company, we don't stand, we all sit around a table. I'm like, that's really hard, because if you're sitting, especially as a junior person, the thing to remember is that you have no power and nobody cares about your opinion at all, right? So you're just really, they don't, it's just the reality. You hate to tell them that. When you come out of Kellogg, you hate to say that to them, but it's true, right? And so you have no power, and if you're sitting there, you can't control that discussion. When you're standing, you have enormous power, right? So if you're taking over, I can just walk over near you, for example, and, and that gives me the ability. To, or if you two start talking, I can just walk over, or you're on your phone, I can walk, and, and then I can walk over near you, and it just change, it gives you this power to like, and if you go to, if you're speaking, and you go to someone who's sort of acting up, you can get them to, the other thing you can always do is if you have a flip chart, you can always say, if you want to take control of a meeting, you can say, you know what, just let's, and you start writing on the flip chart, and everybody naturally will look at you. And that's a way you can take advantage of a meeting as well. Anyway, uh, it has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you to the, uh, to the center for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, to, uh, thank you to, to Ben for putting together this. This is, uh, no, this is fun to do. This is a terrific thing.